Welcome to The In Chamber, the place where we focus on the issues and people that shape business success. I'm your co-host, Rebecca Patrick. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications for the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. Joining me at the microphone is Anthony Shutley, our Director of Communications. In Chamber is presented by the Talent Resource Navigator. With us today is one of our newer colleagues, David Ober, who joined the Indiana Chamber last summer as the Vice President of Taxation and Public Finance. David previously represented House District 82 for six years in the Indiana General Assembly and then was appointed to the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission by Governor Holcomb in 2018. David is going to catch us up on all things tax-related and talk a little politics. David, good to chat with you in this setting. Thanks for asking me to join. Before we get into the public policy side of things, let's get to know you a little better. What or who inspired you to get involved in politics and to run for state the state legislature at such a young age? I believe you were 25 when you took office. That's correct. Yeah, I, I got very involved in student government in my last year and a half or two years uh, at college at uh, Purdue Calumet at the time. It's now been rebranded to Purdue Northwest in Lake County, uh, Hammond, Indiana, and really found an interest in politics. And when I graduated, received my degree and came back to my home county of Noble County in Northeast Indiana, decided that I wanted to get involved in politics, wanted to uh, work on campaigns and uh, eventually run for an office. I just wasn't prepared for redistricting to happen in 2011, which opened up a brand new state legislative seat uh, in my home county. And I ran in a fairly crowded four-way primary and was successful in that May. And then that kind of uh, set the set the path before me. On the national stage in particular, we hear a lot about needing fresh, younger faces and new ideas to enter the political arena. What was it like for you to be in the state legislature at such a young age? And what was your reception there at the state house? It was interesting coming into a body where the average age is somewhere in the you know 50s and 60s, being a 25-year-old, don't have nearly the life experience that your colleagues do. But I felt very much at home and respected and appreciated right out of the gate uh, as a legislator. None of my colleagues, um, I, I think they had an appropriate respect for the just the lack of life experience relative to themselves. But, uh, you know, when you've gone through an election process, you've received a majority of uh, votes from your constituents in the district. We all get there the same way. And you have one vote just like everybody else. Uh, there's just a level of respect that comes along with that. Now, I won't say that there weren't some hijinks and uh, experiences based on my age that uh, may have been different from some of my um, senior colleagues, but I, I felt very much uh, a part of the team and um, uh, like I belong, like I was where I belonged uh, right from the from the start. As we noted earlier, you left the General Assembly in 2018. It seems politics in general have really changed a lot in those subsequent years. It's only been four and a half, five years, but how would you characterize sort of things then and now? Yeah, I was, um, my last election was 2016 and that was kind of the rise of, uh, Donald Trump and his influence over the Republican party. And, uh, I left the legislature and was appointed to the IURC then before, uh, the 2018 primaries. And so I did not uh, spend any time working in lo- you know, local politics or state politics uh, during the midterm of the Trump years, but it has changed a lot. It seems to me, at least, that kind of the culture of our national politics and the Congress and the executive branch have made their way down to the state level. That wasn't true when I was first elected. It was very much kind of a bipartisan environment. And and it still is to a certain degree. I mean, I think most laws that are made or most bills that are passed are going to pass with huge bipartisan support. They're going to be 98 to zero in the House or 20, you know, or, you know, 40 to zero in the Senate. And um, the issues that differentiate the two parties are the ones that you would expect are the ones that get all the media attention. But it really has, uh, I have seen a shift in the tone and tenor of how the parties interact with each other, how 
uh, certain bills move and uh, or don't move, uh, if that's the case. And uh, just the way that I characterize things is that that national media driven um, aspect of the way that Congress works has kind of made its way to the state legislature. And that's not necessarily a good thing. I think that it's made the process more difficult. It's made collegiality and bipartisanship a lot harder. In the first half of this legislative session, you led the chamber's efforts on the now Senate Enrolled Act 2, which is providing significant and immediate federal income tax relief for most Hoosier businesses. Fill us in on the details and why the chamber made this a top legislative priority. Yeah, so probably most importantly, this comes from a, ta- a flurry of tax changes that were made in kind of the first full year of the Trump administration. Uh, Congress passed a pretty sweeping uh, package of tax reforms. They uh, shrunk the number of tax brackets and they changed the rates. They had, uh, lowered the corporate income tax rate and there were a bunch of different kind of tax relief pieces and then different aspects of how they might pay for or offset the revenue loss from the tax cuts that they passed in uh, late 2017. And one of those, we'll call them pay fours, it was a revenue generator, was a cap on the amount of state and local tax that individuals who itemize their taxes at the federal level can deduct the, on, on their return. And so that $10,000 cap meant that you could deduct up to $10,000, but if you had state and local tax liabilities that exceeded $10,000, well, you were just going to have to pay those liabilities. You couldn't deduct them on your federal taxes. And that was uh, extra revenue that the federal government was receiving that they weren't receiving before because it was pretty much unlimited deductibility uh, for these, these state and local taxes. So the tax that, that SALT cap is what we'll call it, state and local tax cap, uh, impacted a lot of states differently, mostly states with higher tax rates than perhaps Indiana were impacted to a higher degree. And I think that there may have been some politics behind, you know, the blue states and the red states, states with relatively higher tax rates tend to be blue states. And uh, I, so I think that there was some politics kind of hidden behind uh, the policy decision. But what Senate Enrolled Act 2, or we'll call it Public Law 1, because as you mentioned, it's been passed and signed by the governor at this point, so it is state law, uh, allows individuals who are owners of Hoosier pass-through entities uh, to pay their income tax at the business level, and that becomes a... Uh, a tax expense that can be immediately deducted, and then they receive a dollar for dollar tax credit on their state return. And what this, t- you know, in, in very simple terms does is it lowers their federal tax uh, taxable income uh, by the same amount as if they had full deductibility without the cap. And so this is uh, estimated to provide $100 million plus uh, in tax relief for Hoosier business owners, Uh, It's something that came up last summer and the chamber and and myself and some of our members have been really working diligently on this and was really pleased to see that the Senate Majority Caucus made it a priority and then both the House and Senate and the governor put it on a fast track to try and get it to to actually get it done before the end of the session uh, because folks are preparing to file their tax returns for 2022 this bill is retroactive to be able to allow them to take full advantage for that 2022 tax year. And um, so it, it's it's a huge bill. We're, we're ecstatic that it passed so quickly, uh, but that's kind of the reasoning behind the, the effort. You've written for our blog about the state budget, and overall it seems quite favorable to economic development, business, and the workforce. It highlights for us, and what's currently missing from what the House passed that we would like to see included? Yeah, so the budget uh, gets introduced as kind of the governor's recommendations, and then the House and the Senate will make their changes and uh, details and differences get haggled out at the last couple of weeks. But uh, the House amended version of the bill uh, does do a lot of wonderful things that will um, positively impact the business landscape for Indiana. Uh, We're investing in, um, you know, 
many uh, increases in K-12 education and our, our talent pipeline through kind of higher ed and some of the skills-based uh, programs that uh, have been successful in the past. Uh, it makes investments in infrastructure and uh, includes uh, a second round of ready, which if you remember from a few years ago, the first round of ready was a half a billion dollars that primarily was federal dollars. So a little more strings attached. This is a second round, $500 million that has, is state dollars and is a little more flexible. So we'll be doing uh, pushing, pushing in that direction. Uh, includes some flexibility for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation as far as the uh, tax credits that they manage and um, some of the tools that they have for like deal closings and site acquisition for some major projects or big deals that they might be working on. Uh, so those are all positive economic development tools that will uh, lend themselves well over the next biennium. Um, increases um, uh, or puts new dollars into a revolving loan fund to help provide financing for infrastructure for housing. Uh, there was a housing task force that finished its work last fall. Many of the recommendations have moved forward in some form this session, but probably the biggest one that's been funded in the budget is $125 million that's been set aside and a revolving loan fund to be accessed by local governments to um, provide some dollars for infrastructure expansion to allow housing projects to move forward. So lots to go, uh, lots, lots of uh, jetway yet to go. We would like to see some augmentation on some of the funding, uh, certainly more flexibility uh, in the governor's budget on some of the IEDC tools that I just mentioned. I would like to see those, uh, that flexibility be uh, returned to the original form and maybe augmented if possible. But um, those are the arguments that we'll be taking to the, the Senate leadership now uh, at, that they have House Bill 1001. David, if I could ask you a follow-up question about the budget, is there any indication now sort of where maybe the battles, the big battles on the budget may be um, as the session wraps up? It actually seems as if there's going to be a bit of a kumbaya moment. Uh, obviously, House and Senate uh, or House Republicans and Democrats have differing priorities. They'd like to see funding or money that they would like to see, um, you know, in this fund or that fund. I would say the largest battle that uh, we'll likely see in the budget going forward is going to be uh, around the school choice scholarships or vouchers. House Republicans in their amended uh, version of the bill did a broad expansion of that program that was put into place about a decade and a half ago and uh, it dramatically increases the number of vouchers and the pathways to receive a voucher. And it's uh, a, a pretty uh, sizable portion of the new K-12 dollars that have been appropriated. House Democrats were very much opposed to it. And there's been a lot in the media in recent weeks about Senate Republican leadership, specifically Senator Ryan Mishler, uh, who chairs the Senate Appropriations uh, Committee and is uh, skeptical of that program, or at least he has been in the past. So I think that's probably the largest battle line that's been drawn thus far. Uh, but there are certainly more that could be added as the process moves. Property tax relief has been a big topic of discussion for lawmakers. Uh, the session as it, as it is in many sessions, uh, where do things stand now and, and where do we see this landing, especially relative to impacting employers? Sure. After everyone received their kind of assessed value notice in the mail last year, the, the uh, noise from property owners started to, to gather. And I think a lot of legislators heard that and wanted to file some ideas uh, in legislation to provide some property tax relief given the just dramatic increases in property tax bills. Um, so there were a number of bills that were filed this session and uh, most of those have died in this first half, uh, but there is one large bill and that's House Bill 1499. It's authored by Representative Jeff Thompson who chairs House Ways and Means. And this bill does a lot of different things within property tax, uh, the property tax system. Uh, but primarily, it lowers the property tax caps for 
homestead properties. So residential first homes, not vacation homes, but the, the home that you live in. Uh, it lowers the 1% cap down to 0.9% in the first year, 0.95% in the second year. Uh, so it's a, it's temporarily moving that. Um, it's a huge impact to local government uh, fun, uh, funding. And um, there are other pieces of the bill that would increase uh, renters deduction and increase certain other income tax deductions that the state would pay for. But uh, the, the whole point of the legislation is to provide kind of some temporary relief for the, the large wave that we know is coming, that bills are going to hit here in the next couple of weeks and people are going to be uh, reasonably uh, shocked and upset about what, it, what their bill says. Uh, so the House and the Senate are both working on various pieces of legislation that deal with property tax relief. The big concern for the business community is when you alter things that impact the assessed value calculation. Uh, if you're providing relief uh, on that side of the equation for one property tax class, it shifts the cost of local government to the two and the three percent property classes, which by and large, our business owners. And so that is of great concern to us. There are some aspects of House Bill 1499 that would do some shifting. It's not as big as uh, it, it might have been, but it's still concerning where it might go as the process kind of works itself out. One tax measure that created quite a stir is Senate Bill 3, which would create a task force to study Indiana's tax laws and the feasibility of eliminating the state's income tax. It comes from the Senate Tax and Fiscal Policy Chair, Travis Holdman, so it carries quite a bit of weight. What prompted him starting this discussion, and what does the business community and the chamber particular particularly think about this? Sure. I, I think what prompted the conversation is simply the fact that coming out of the pandemic with federal dollars and inflation, the state was just collecting an, an abundance of dollars. Uh, state revenues were so far above appropriations that they decided twice to send money back to taxpayers because they were just flush with, with cash. So when you're collecting so much extra money, uh, you, you either have to do one of two things. You are going to increase appropriations, grow programs, grow spending, or you're going to reduce rates so that you're not collecting as much. And I think that that is the impetus for the conversation that is kicked off with Senate Bill 3 um, offered by Senator Holdman. Um, it does have far-reaching implications as to the business community and the chamber is very engaged in this conversation because um, involved in this task force is a list of items that they want to study. Some of that is, you know, eliminating the state's income tax, uh, which you might think would only impact individuals. But as we talked about before with Senate Enrolled Act 2, uh, business owners who are um, pass-through entities actually pay income tax at the individual level. And so if you zero out the income tax, that would provide relief to a business owner on business income. Uh, that's a really important aspect uh, of this study. Uh, looking at property tax, local option, income tax, kind of the entire ecosystem and what might it look. Uh, and in fact, Senator Holdman said, if we were a new state entering the union, what would our tax system look like if we were drawing it up in 2023? Uh, versus the tax system that we have in place. And so we're really invested in this conversation uh, from the standpoint of the chamber and the business community. I think it's important to provide as much uh, input and data as we possibly can and um, hopefully influence some of the policy decisions that will come uh, after the task force concludes its work. Any indication of when you think there may be is there a time frame sort of attached to the task force and when things could be completed or when some action, real action may happen um, from their recommendations? It seems to be a two year task force. So 2023 and 2024. So we might see some recommendations come out and um, be introduced as legislation in the 2024 session, but certainly the 2025 session. It is, it's anticipated that there will be four meetings yet this year after the legislature ends its work at, um, in 
early May, late April. And so I expect to see members of this task force will be appointed soon after session ends, and they may even begin their work, uh, you know, in the May, June timeframe uh, this year to be able to get their four meetings in place. Um, so it it will move pr- pretty quickly uh, if this bill becomes law, which it's uh, you know it's expected that it would be. What other tax legislation are you actively involved with that could impact Hoosier employers? There are a whole host of bills that have been filed that provide specific incentives on tax for activities that an employer may be engaging in. Uh, probably one that's that's kind of tacitly in my area, but I'm working with one of my colleagues, one of our colleagues, Jason Bierce, on the child care tax credit, which would provide a tax credit against investments that are made by employers to expand uh, child care options for their employees. Uh, that's something that the chamber supports and uh, is a, you know, if it's not number one, it's number two um, uh, issue that's been uh, offered up by employers in our employer survey that we do on an annual basis. Uh, it's either housing or child care. And so it's one of those items that uh, the state is lacking in capacity, uh, specifically in uh, area rural areas around the state. And uh, much is needed to boost that capacity so that parents can uh, have those options for, for child care for their children. Um, other areas would be in um, the um, six, there's a bill in the Senate that deals with successor liability. Uh, so if you are doing a merger and acquisition um, and that company that you have targeted for acquisition has outstanding tax liabilities with the state, it uh, changes some rules for how uh, you might get clearance so that you don't have as part of that transaction um, a situation where you would assume the liability for that tax. So we're working on language that would improve that. Um, having broad conversations, again, about uh, a lot of property tax legislation that's that's moving. So uh, there's a lot going on, but most of it is going to be in House Bill 1001, Senate Bill 2, Senate Bill 3. And then there are two other tax bills that uh, passed out of the Senate last week uh, that have various tax um tax policies in them. Another area that falls under your um, purview is local government. Um, The Indiana Chamber has been a vocal proponent of local government reform and efficiency for many years. There was, I think, a bit of a glimmer of hope in this arena earlier this month that another piece of legislation was gaining momentum. Uh, Can you fill us in what happened with that legislation? Yes, there there were a number of bills that were filed in the House this year that deal with uh, township government and uh, various ways in which we might find some synergies there. Um, One of those bills would eliminate or or not eliminate, but at least provide an opportunity for voters to weigh in on whether or not to keep their township assessor. There are you know, 13 township assessors or 13 counties that have township assessors in the state remaining. And, um, you know, they voted about 10 years ago or eight years ago, and this would give them another opportunity to um, decide whether or not that that institution and in their communities is still viable, still relevant to, uh, to the services that they're receiving. Uh, some Uh, a pilot program that would allow merging between uh, various uh, levels of local government, either a township, two townships merging or uh, municipalities that that bill was amended, but did move forward. We have a couple of different uh, proposals that have made it out of the house that deal with transparency in local government, providing more information on websites Uh, archiving of video of public meetings. And we've supported all of this legislation because we think that it improves the quality of the services that people are receiving and paying for at the local level. And um, we're hoping that they'll get a a full vetting in the Senate. Uh, This is where typically in the the part of the process where these types of bills have faced uh, pretty steep headwinds. 
Um, but there is some legislation from the Senate that came over to the House dealing with township government reform, solving a very, very uh, specific problem in a couple of counties. And I think that, that might be a vehicle to put some of these ideas that the House has already passed uh, to keep it alive for uh, the con- for conference committee time, which is the last four weeks of session. Now, a quick word about our sponsor. The Talent Resource Navigator is a new free online tool that offers the convenience of one-stop shopping for education and job training opportunities. Supported by on-demand customer service and technical assistance, the Navigator intentionally guides and connects individuals and employers with a tailored set of talent development resources based on each user's identified needs. Details at talentresourcenavigator.com. So right before you came to the chamber, you spent four years as a commissioner with the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission. Rate increases, which are often hot topics, sometimes contentious uh, topics, are back in the news. So how did the commission deal with such a request? Or how, how does the commission deal with such a request from utility? And how does the commission view its role related to the General Assembly? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so the IURC is the venue for which a utility will make filings to adjust all sorts of different aspects of how they provide service and at what cost uh, to their ratepayers. Uh, the, the commission is meant to simulate competition uh, where there is none because these utilities by and large are monopolies. They have a uh, specific franchise, a, um, a service territory where they are the exclusive provider to ratepayers. And so from time to time, utilities will come into the commission with a filing for a rate case or some minor rate adjustment. Um, and, and that really kind of kickstarts a, a judicial process or a quasi-judicial process where evidence and testimony is, is filed into a record. Uh, we have a hearing and the uh, there are witnesses that go on the stand and they'll answer questions about their testimony and be cross-examined, much like if, uh, if you were to watch a courtroom drama. There were times when it certainly felt like that. Um, and, and then once the record is closed, then the commission will go through each of the different uh, perspectives that were filed on the case and make a decision. Um, and this, the typical standard that the commission will have to uh, fall back on is uh, just and reasonable rates and in the public interest. And so rate increases, um, I think are coming uh, much more frequently. Part of that is to do with uh, fuel prices uh, in the last several years, specifically in the last 24 months, uh, there have been a number of macroeconomic factors. I mean, think the, um, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, is probably the prime one that has disrupted these natural gas markets around the world. Uh, the United States is exporting more natural gas to Western Europe so that they can be more independent from Russia as a response to the incursion in the Ukraine. And so that increased prices here domestically, and that kind of all flows into rates at some point. Uh, so utilities were getting uh, rate increases reflecting those increased costs. And um, so it's never... Uh, what a utility commissioner gets up every morning wanting to do is just increase rates and uh, do it more as frequently as they possibly can. Uh, but the utility, in order to provide the service, which everybody relies on, everybody wants the light switch to come on when they flip it. Everybody wants their home to be heated and cooled to a, a comfortable temperature. And so that is the job of the economic regulator, the IURC, is to make sure that the utility has adequate capital to finance the operations and keep the lights on. Uh, Related to the General Assembly, um, the the commission is an independent uh, agency. The members of the five member commission are appointed by the governor. It has a uh, separate uh, nominating committee, just like the, um, just like uh, an an opening or a a vacancy on the court of appeals or the Supreme court. Uh, You have to be on a list of three names that are submitted to the governor. So it's a, quite a lengthy process. But um, truthfully, the the IURC's job is to implement and enact the laws that the legislature passes 
And um, we did that to the best of our ability. It's not a perfect uh, circle. Uh, from time to time, they disagree. Pe- parties that appear before us would disagree with our assessment of what the law says, and that's why we have appeals courts. But uh, it, it's a it's an interesting role being an independent uh, agency and being one of five commissioners. Dave, let me let me ask you uh, about uh, a ranking here. Indiana is among the ten best states according to the Tax Foundation State Business Tax Climate Index. Uh, which is a factor in relocation and expansion. Uh, Indiana has been number nine of the past two years. So what are we doing right? And how do we move up the rankings? What's missing there? Yeah, so we have been in the top 10 for a number of years as far as business tax climate, um, all all positive factors. I think part of uh, the difficulty in moving up is the states that we're competing against. Uh, Many of those states have zero income tax. Uh, Many of those states have uh, lower sales tax um, and different regulations around how taxes uh, are collected or or how the tax law is enforced by maybe a Department of Revenue. So uh, there are tons of factors. It's a multivariate uh, index that they put together, but you're not wrong. Uh, These are factors that businesses look at when they make their decision about whether they're going to invest a billion dollars in a facility or whether they're going to relocate to a different state. And so I think that this aspect of uh, Indiana's tax climate is deeply tied to the work that's going to be done by the tax task force that's anticipated West Senate Bill 3. Uh, These are all... um, aspects of uh, our climate that will be that the chamber will be presenting to the task force as things to look at. It's going to require a, a comparative analysis with other states, um, states that uh, we either compete for directly when it comes to economic development deals or states that we're benchmarking off of for population growth or business investment or uh, a whole host of different things. So how do we move up the rankings? I think we have to look at aspects of the states that are in front of us that we could emulate or improve upon. And uh, Senate Bill 3 is the cer- certainly the venue and the forum where those conversations are going to take place. Dave, give us just a bit of context into where this issue ranks for businesses. I mean, is it among the top issues? Is it one of a cadre of issues that they consider when relocating and expanding in Indiana? At one point in time, I think in the state of Indiana, our our tax climate may have been the very top. Um, What tax incentives we offer, what our, um, you know, our marginal tax rates are, that may have been the number one item. I think more and more these days, what we are experiencing is workforce is probably the, the number one um, having access to a uh, trained and skilled workforce. And that is where Indiana, compared to other states, may be facing some headwinds and some challenges. I think that our legislature and our leadership in the state are, are very focused. The chamber is very focused on how do we improve workforce metrics. Um, but workforce, uh, energy costs, um, environmental policies, these are all things that I, I don't think that they have left over taxation, but I think that they are mentioned more frequently with taxation um, and are more heavily weighted when a business is looking at uh, expanding their operations in a state or uh, making a large investment in a facility Um whether or not our faci- our uh, businesses are investing in automation or expanding their workforce. Um, those are uh, some of the aspects of um, just the state uh, policy overlay when it comes to attracting capital uh, from within and from without the state. Rankings, it seems these days are a dime a dozen, but this tax climate issue is not just about rankings, it's reality. Some of our neighbors, Illinois, Iowa, and Ohio, for for instance, have all exempted tangible personal property uh, from taxation. So what's been the hesitancy by Indiana lawmakers? Yeah, so two bills were filed this session, one in the House and one in the Senate, uh, that would increase the, um, the de minimis amount of investment that is exempt from the tangible personal property tax. 
Um, there's obviously a price tag that is associated with the local governments there. I think that's probably the driving force behind the hesitancy is that uh, local governments would necessarily receive less revenue if this tax were altered or eliminated. Um, the House has passed this a number of times, most recently last year, and the Senate has not acted on it, partially because the fiscal impact uh, to local governments is, uh, is very significant. Um, but the hope is, again, uh, I hate to go back to the study is uh, the study task force that's going to be working on this can consider this amongst everything else. Uh, but that really is the best venue to be able to bring these arguments of how do we improve Indiana's relative position as far as business tax climate uh, by taking a look at things like the tangible personal property tax, because um, Illinois has a number of problems as far as their business climate, regard, you know, specifically related to tax and just the regulatory environment. Um, but we miss out on certain investments and certain deals just simply because uh, of their elimination of this specific tax. Uh, so how do we improve our position and how do we um, compare favorably to these states? Um, it's something that the chamber has been pushing in the past uh, very diligently. It's something that will continue to push until it's accomplished. Uh, but we've got to figure out how to accomplish this without causing a huge, um, you know, up, uh, causing a huge problem for local governments and how they finance themselves. One final question on the state legislature. What's the mood? What's it like when the second half of session gets underway? I imagine things are a little bit more tense to find homes for some policies since this is really, this is really it. This is the last opportunity. Yeah. The, so the first several weeks um, bills are being you know assigned to a bill list. They're being assigned to committees. Committees are kind of um, building up their agendas and it takes a couple of weeks for the committee activity to really spin up to its, its full force. The second half is very much the same. Uh, you know, it, it's, there's not a whole lot to do. The The daily sessions uh, for the House and the Senate are not uh, much longer than maybe 30 minutes. So they'll come in, they'll pass a resolution, they'll uh, maybe do a few things, and then they will adjourn for the day. And so until committees start to spin up, there's a whole lot of, uh, th there's not a whole lot of work to do. But it is uh, increasingly uh, apparent at that at that stage of session that um, you got to get things moving. You've got to find a, if your bill didn't move in the first half, or if you've got something that's stuck in a committee, you may have to find another vehicle for it. And so uh, I won't call it desperation, but there is a whole lot more um, behind the scenes activity of legislators trying to find uh, vehicles for ideas and trying to uh, get a committee chairman to, to hear their bill. Um, it, it, it gets, um, it, tense is probably the right word for it um, because you're just trying to get uh, get your ideas forward and get the work done. David, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Stay up to date with the 2023 legislative activity at the Chamber's Online Policy Center at indianachamber.com slash policy. Bills of importance to the business community and the Indiana Chamber's position on each one is listed there in the latest edition of our legislative agenda. In Chamber is presented by the Talent Resource Navigator. As always, thank you for listening.